Thomas Barley is a hero you have never heard of. Now you may think, Quincy, I know about history. I probably have heard of Thomas Barley, or I can use Google and find out who he is. No, you are wrong. You don't know who Thomas Barley is, nor do I think you could figure out. Because there's a lot of people named Thomas Barley. If you Google it, and you'll find a lot of different people, and even some who did heroic things, and none of them are the person I am talking about. No, I am telling a tale about Britain's battle against slavery. A hundred years of campaign against one of the most evil institutions in the history of mankind. And Thomas Barley, the man you have never heard of. But first, some context. I'll be going through a bunch of various videos and historical documents and articles because turns out there are other smarter people than me and I can just have them say things and since they know things better than me I can just watch their videos. And honestly if you wanted to turn this video off right now go into the description of this video and go watch all these videos and read these articles and pour through these old C logbooks I would be a happy Morris. In fact, you should do that. But since you're not, and still listening to me, and I have not scared you away with my lack of comedic skill and lack of rhetorical skill, I suppose I will just have to move on. So the fight against slavery. As William Edward Hartpole Lecky said, the unweary, unostentatious, and inglorious crusade of England against slavery may probably be regarded as among the three or four perfectly virtuous pages comprised in the history of nations. So how was it exactly that Britain fought against slavery, and were they ultimately successful? We are going to start this story about Thomas Barley, the hero you've never heard of, at the end of the story, and work backwards. And hopefully by working backwards, you might figure out who he is, but honestly, I think you won't. So starting with context by one of my favorite economists and historians, Thomas Sowell. While the British could simply abolish slavery in their Western Hemisphere colonies, they faced a more daunting and longer lasting task of patrolling the Atlantic off the coast of Africa in order to prevent slave ships of various nationalities from continuing to supply slaves illegally. Even during the Napoleonic Wars, Britain continued to keep some of its warships on patrol off West Africa. Moreover, such patrols likewise tried to interdict the shipments of slaves from East Africa through the Indian Ocean, the Red Sea, and the Persian Gulf. Brazil capitulated to British demands that it end its slave trade after being publicly humiliated by British warships that seized and destroyed slave ships within Brazil's own waters. In 1873, Two British cruisers appeared off the coast of Zanzibar and threatened to blockade the island unless the slave market there shut down. It was shut down. It would be hard to think of any other crusade pursued so relentlessly for so long by any nation at such mounting costs without any economic or other tangible benefit to itself. Again, you can watch this whole video in its entirety, and I encourage you to do, but more context. No. On the issue of slavery, it was essentially Western civilization against the world. At the time, Western civilization had the power to prevail against all other civilizations. That is how and why slavery was destroyed as an institution in almost the whole world. But it did not happen all at once or even within a few decades. When the British finally stamped out slavery in Tanganyika in 1922, it was more than half a century after the Emancipation Proclamation in the United States, and vestiges of slavery still survived in parts of Africa into the 21st century. So, Britain was ultimately successful in its campaign against slavery in the early 1900s, as we heard, and then in the late 1800s. But it was not always this way. Uh, but we'll get into that. I want to go into an article here uh, explaining costly international moral actions, Britain's 60-year campaign, campaign against the Atlantic slave trade. So this is more specifically about the Atlantic slave trade, but Britain eventually, as we heard there, in the later 1800s and early 1900s, ended up fighting and defeating slavery all over the world. 
So, in this article, we develop a theory of costly international moral action by investigating the most expensive example recorded in modern history. Britain's effort to suppress the Atlantic slave trade from 1807 until finally succeeding in 1867. Britain carried out this effort despite its domination of both the slave trade and world sugar production, which was based on slave labor. In 1805 to 1806, the value of British West Indian sugar production equaled about 4% of the national income of Great Britain. Its efforts to suppress the slave trade sacrificed these interests, brought the country Country into conflict with the other Atlantic maritime powers and cost Britain more than 5,000 lives as well as an average nearly 2% of national income annually for 60 years. So this was a long and expensive effort um, of massive scale. Basically I'm wanting to illustrate the massive scale but that Britain's efforts were especially important and especially effective and integral into ending slavery. People debate how much is it, you know, Britain only, or is it just a massive important part? The point that I'm trying to make is that it was just important. Uh, so, it wasn't always this way. In fact, in the middle of the 1800s, so we're moving again more backwards in time, it almost seemed hopeless. Uh, this speech, which I basing actually a lot of this on, and there's a lot of quotes from here and a lot of great evidence, and honestly you should just go listen to this entire hour-long video, but you're not, you're listening to me. Um, so I'll have a quick quote here that he's quoting, which I was going to quote myself, but I don't like saying words. Pressing on, right? Here's a quote from 1845, and I'm going to actually read the full quote, um, because it's pretty shocking. Here we are on the most miserable station in the, whole, in the wide world, and attempting an impossibility, the suppression of the slave trade. We look upon the whole affair out here as a complete humbug. You may make treaties in London and send the whole combined squadrons of English and, England and France to the coast, and then you will not have gained your object. So long as a slave worth only a few dollars here fetches 80 or 100 pounds in America, men and means will be found to evade the strictest blockade. The absurdity of blockading a coast 2,000 miles in extent must be obvious to the meanest capacity. Even if successful, you must be prepared to continue the force forever in a day, or your labor is lost. For the moment the ships are removed, the business commences. That's 1845. That's after trying this for 40 years. And you have a Royal Navy captain saying, let's give up, this thing's impossible, right? Yes, sir. Okay, so it seemed impossible, and they wanted to give up, a lot of people wanted to give up in 1845. We have moved back, but as we see, they were ultimately successful. Why? Why would they continue to fight? Uh, we'll have a quick quote here as to some of the reasons as to why they would continue this effort despite it seeming hopeless. Because again, slavery is as old as history. How could one nation try to stop it? With the brighter sides of humanity is that you have these sailors and you have these cross-cultural brokers that do these tremendously redemptive acts, right? They do these things on behalf of others and they keep coming back, right? So this case study brings out some of the worst and some of the best in humanity. And I think that's one of the things that's so compelling about it, is it is this thankless fight that you have these British sailors keep coming back to. At times, I mean, they're risking their lives. They take 6.7% casualties per year due to malaria. Mm. It's a third, or it's three times the highest, or the death rate in the West Africa posting is three times the death rate of any other posting in the Royal Navy. And you have crews that come back for three or four tours voluntarily, and they take career hits to do it. Something causes these people to come back and say, this is my fight, I'm going to win it, right? And, but yet, the other side of human nature is always evident also, right? Where somebody is weak and I can take something from them. So the, that is woven throughout this case study. So hopefully I'm illustrating the heroic nature of the West Africa squadron, how they're fighting this seemingly impossible fight against pure evil, and they don't really think that they're succeeding, but ultimately they did. We know that from history. But did they actually play a role? Did, they, did the West Africa squadron, which is the, the military arm of Britain's effort to end the Atlantic slave trade, were they actually successful, or were they just sailing around trying to do something good? And this is really important, this, this clip right here. And in, in many cases, the British are held 
The British suppression attempt is held as ineffective because it does it only recaptures five percent of the captives that go across the Atlantic. One of the things that we'll find is is that they are. Uh, by most historians, they are held liable for not capturing ships that they couldn't legally capture anyways, right? So if you correct it back to they could only go after 1.5 million, realize, and we'll see a lot of this later, as the slave traders adapt, then they start changing their business model to, to, to expose themselves to less risk. And one of the key things that they do is they don't load captives until the very end, right? So the British, two out of three British captures are actually capturing empty ships. They're capturing ships with shackles, too much food, uh, slave decks, the, they are capturing ships with prima facie evidence of, of slaving, but they are not capturing ships with captives on board. Um, so really, if you multiply that through, you'll find that the British are actually about 30 to 40% effective in terms of interdiction. That's pretty significant. Um, but in order to get there, they have to go through a diplomatic effort of, of weaving together this treaty network. And Jenny Martinez at Stanford, Stanford Law School talks a lot about this, where she actually points at the British effort to build this treaty network is one of the major keys in the rise of international law. Is that prior to this, there's a huge debate between the United States and the British on this, where the United States would prefer to just call it piracy and say, basically, there is pirates enjoying no protection, so therefore anyone can go after a pirate. The British actually want to make positive law about it. We don't want to be part of any British positive law because we're basically sabotaging everything they're trying to do. It has very little to do with slavery. It has everything to do with you know, Anglo-American competition. But Jenny Martinez points out that that effort to build this treaty network, that's really the first time where they're building um, a lot of this official law. Once they, once they lock that in, then you actually have a suppression effort. The Brit once the British can go after essentially every ship, every slaver that's on the seas, you start seeing it more about tactics at that point. The slavers are no longer looking for legal tactics, they're looking for physical tactics. What are the fastest ships? What, what, what flags will let me get away with it? What, what business practices allow me to isolate myself from risk? And then once... So ultimately it became a question of tactics. Once Britain was able to form these coalitions uh, to fight against slavery, it just came down to a brass tax of fighting. Uh, and catching them. And the West Africa squadron was able to have a really high interception rate of 30 to 40 percent. And because of their tactics, they were forcing the slavers to pick up slaves towards the end of the journey, meaning that they were, the West Africa squadron was able to capture a significant number of slave ships before they got slaves, which really is the ideal thing. You want to take out the ships before they're even able to do uh, the slavery. Um, and so what I'm trying to basically point out here is that the West African squadron played a significant role. Uh, or here, moving on to another article by allthatsinteresting.com. It's estimated that between its founding in 1808 and its dissolution in 1860, the West Africa squadron captured around 1,600 ships. The efforts also proved successful in swaying other countries to follow suit. Starting in the 1820s, the United States Navy assisted the West Africa squadron, and eventually the creation of the Webster-Ashbury Treaty of 1842 ensured that the U.S. contribution ensured that the U.S. contribute to the Africa Squadron. The West Africa Squadron may not have been able to eliminate the slave trade on its own, but its very existence was a deterrent to the continuing the practice. To continuing the practice. As the abolitionists had originally hoped, the elimination of the trade was eventually followed by emancipation for slaves in the British Empire in 1833 throughout the rest of the 19th century. Most of the European nations of the United States would follow Britain's lead in ending slavery through the Western world. So Britain, which was ultimately successful in, you know, the early 1900s and late 1800s, and was doubtful of its success, thanks in major part to the West Africa Squadron's success, it was able to form these coalitions that was ultimately successful. And part of the reason why it took so long is that slavery made a ridiculous amount of money, that money was able to gain a lot of influence, and so this is why stopping the slave trade, not just on a moral grounds, but also on a ta uh, strategic grounds of keeping the slave industry from having money to win political battles ultimately resulted in this very slow, very gradual, ultimate success. So the West Africa Squadron played a big part in that, is what I'm wanting you to get out of this. But why? Why was the West Africa Squadron so successful?
And this is where we get closer to the story of Thomas Barley, because you're probably asking, this is about Thomas Barley, you haven't mentioned his name once. No, and I won't mention his name for a while, because again, this is a story in reverse. We'll get to him at the end of the story. Chips, right, is that they have to put them up for, option, for auction. So in this case, the Black Joke is, one of the, is probably the most legendary ship of the period, where it had such a reputation with slavers is that slavers would go all the way down to Angola to avoid it when they heard it was in town, right? So it probably did more damage through its reputation and through the cost of countermeasures the slavers took against it than it actually did by capturing slavers, right? So that's important. There is a ship, the Black Joke, wildly devastating reputation, forces the slavers to take on these bad tactics and bad routes, just hearing that it's in the area. So the Black Joke plays an important part. That's what I'm wanting you to pick up here. Which is one of these points is that, think about a flat network, they don't actually get to aggregate tactics. They don't have conferences. They just go on rumors. So if you get something really scary, it'll cause a lot of rumors. So actually it's that rumor mill that causes that to be a very good you know, deterrence weapon, for lack of a better term. He captures, <clears throat> so this ship is one of the better ships that he finds. He captures it and then he uses it as a tender to his ship, right? So he's not allowed to make it a warship because he can't commission it, which is why it's Her Majesty's Brig, not Her Majesty's ship, right? Um, but he, the way he uses it as a tender, it, typically tenders are going to carry supplies or whatever, right? So the supply it carries is a 16-inch pivot gun and a <laughs> fully armed crew and basically nothing else. <laughs> so he strips this thing down, makes it an interdictor, right? And, and it ends up being tremendously successful. So this is out of uh, this is this is out of the dissertation, but I think this one exchange is is really pretty fascinating. So while history is written at the operational tactical level, perhaps you might in, in, indulge my excursion in the or while history is written at the operational and strategic level, perhaps you might indulge this this excursion into the tactical. Over the course of the campaign, there were relatively few attempts on the part of the slavers to meet the British crews in direct naval combat. This is notable as the British relied extensively on small ships, and in many cases, the slavers would have had, at least on paper, the stronger force in an engagement. I believe that one of the signal achievements of this period of suppression was the establishment of clear tactical dominance of the cruisers over the slavers in naval combat. Um, the reputation get garnered by um, the, the Black Joke and the Fair Rosamond, which was another one of the Baltimore Clippers, turn into interdictors. Um, set the foundation for tactical narrative amongst the slavers that the cruisers could be evaded, tricked, and sometimes outrun, but they could not be outfought. So that's important. The British had to use these really small, light, fast ships that were low on armament, and that the slavers should have been able to defeat because they had more guns and more crew. They tended to, especially against the Black Joke, which we'll get into later. So why? Why did the Black Joke, which was this small ship with very few guns and very few crew that should not have been scary to these slavers, why did it have this reputation that made everyone that made these ships avoid it and force these slavers to take on uh, non-advantageous strategic actions, which allowed the West uh, Africa Squadron to have 30 to 40 percent interdiction rate, which allowed their success to make the British able to form these coalitions, which ultimately led to the success and the stopping of the slave trade. Why did the Black Joke have this reputation? Well, it's in large part due to a single battle, and now we'll hear about that. So the engagement between the Black Joke and the Almirante, this was in uh, 18, uh, 1831. It was actually 1829, I think he's thinking about a different battle that took place in 1831, but that it doesn't really matter, I just figured I'd say that. Would have been uh, common among mariners on both sides of the battle as memorialized in art and articles uh, decades later. In purely technical sailing terms, the Black Joke's success was remarkable as it was handily outgunned and outclassed by the slaver the Almirante, which is a formidable vessel with a competent crew, which by rights could have and should have won the engagement. The success of the cruiser, the manner in which it succeeded, and the extent to which the lore of the battle was retold amongst the sailors at the time makes a battle worth retelling here. So the Black Joke and the Almirante were both fast sailing brigs of 200 and 360 tons, respectively. Still small ships, but the Almirante is really more, more uh, proper frigate. Um, Almirante is pierced for 20 cannons and mounted 14 heavy guns, um, 10 18-pounders and 4 long 9-pounders, so it had a huge broadside. 
The Black Joke had a significantly lighter armament. It had one, that one 18, 18 pounder pivot gun. But a pivot gun, you can point forward or sideways. This ends up becoming a huge tactical advantage. Um, both crews were well crewed. The Royal Navy crew um, crews of this period were experienced in the point of wars. They were, I mean, really probably some of the best, if not the best, fleet of sail or sailors of the age of fighting sail that you would have ever had. So I want to point out how he said the gun, the gunnery, was going to make a big part in the battle, specifically the pivot gun. Okay, moving on. They're all, you know, they've all seen combat. Um, the Almirante actually had a fairly, fairly uh, well-led crew also, where in the after-action report, the British captain doesn't find any flaws in his handling of the vessel. He, he says that, well, one correction, he has one flaw, he doesn't mount aft chasers, he doesn't put two runs backwards, that it is a proving decisive. Um, so Almirante, Almirante outguns them two to one, outcrews them two to one. Really, I mean, they should have won. Um, so the battle begins, this is based on, on the after action report written by the captain of the Black Joke, but uh, it's, uh, <clears throat> he does a pretty good job recounting that. So as they intercept the Almirante, they discover not a soul to be seen on deck. The ship was in good fighting order. It had already thrown overboard its lumber and cut its anchor to make, make best speed being well handled for the moment she commenced the action. Few men had taken more precaution than the captain of the Almirante did. As the fighting commenced, the Almirante turned and fired its broadside at the Black Joke, which missed high with round shot, solid cannonball, in an attempt to dismast the Black Joke. They're, attempt, uh, they're attempting to knock off its mast that, that leaves them dead in the water and, and uh, essentially uh, dead to rights. Had she been successful, obviously, the Almirante would have uh, won the engagement. But this results in furious maneuvering between the two vessels with the Almirante trying to turn into the Black Joke and the Black Joke actually getting right on the tail of the Almirante. Essentially, this is more like a fighter plane than, than being handled you know, in ship in the line combat. The Almirante had loaded up canister and grape shot, but the Black Joke kept its uh, tail position for about 15 minutes within, uh, within cannon shot range, or within uh, half pistol shot range, rather. And, um, which, which, which they use the, the pivot gun using grape shot, not round shot, because they're trying specifically not to, not to um, get the captives in the hole. They're just trying to clear the decks. So they're being intentional in their use of tactics um, based on obviously not trying to hurt anybody um, uh, in prison there. So that brings them within range of Almirante snipers who get up in the rigging. The, the Black Joke uses essentially a shotgun to clear them off of the rigging. Their Marines are shooting at snipers within about that range. Um, as they're using that primary cannon to just clear the decks. Um, the, one of the things that's fascinating is that as they, um, there's 80 crew on the slaver, as, they, as the slaver is fully, um, fully engaged in combat, some of the captives actually um, jump overboard. And one of them is actually rescued by two of the crewmen of the Black Joke while they're under fire. Mm -hmm. um, so that's pretty shocking. I mean, like you were saying, there's, that's, there's a movie in there somewhere. Um, and then, uh, but by this point, the, after 15 minutes of this, the Almirante can no longer turn, can no longer really do anything, and they, they, uh, they strike colors, but after this, the Black Joke lost seven injured crew members, um, one of which would later die of the wound, uh, wounds, whereas the Almirante had 13 killed and 15 wounded, which is about half its, uh, about half its crew. Several captains sustained minor injury, but since the canister and grape shot did not penetrate the hole, no captains were mortally wounded, which is pretty shocking. Um, the lopsided battle, given the asymmetry of force at the outset, should have been a shock to the slavers. Moreover, the singular uh, sailing skill of the British crews would have been striking, in the words of Commodore Collier of the Africa Squadron, a highly experienced and decorated veteran of the Napoleonic era. He was actually with Nelson at the Battle of the Nile, so this guy had seen some more. He said, quote, I have never in my life witnessed a more beautiful specimen of good gunnery than the stern and quarter of the Spaniard exhibit. Uh, the Black Joke would have been on sound tactical footing to abandon the chase um, on account of the creative force, and for some reason they were all in. That's pretty shocking. They really should have disengaged, and yet they, they fight this battle and they win. So I'm going to read that last quote again. There's a whole lot there. The Black Joke wins this incredibly lopsided battle. It gives them this reputation, which causes them to, uh, again, have the West Africa Squadron be really successful because their reputation causes the slavers to adopt bad strategy. That success leads to 
them forming coalition, the Britain forming coalitions, which ultimately sees the end of the slave trade. I'm going to read that final quote again. Uh, this is from express.co.uk, news and history. I like going to different sources because uh, I think it gives you more accurate information when you look at a bunch of different sources. So, Squadron Commodore Francis Collier, on viewing the damage inflicted by the black joke, confessed he had never... He had never in my life witnessed a more beautiful specimen of gunnery. Over the course of five years, the Black Joke captured 11 slave ships, held, helped catch two more, and liberated 3,500 human captives, more than any other anti-slavery ship in the Navy's West African squadron. The Black Joke was Britain's most successful weapon against the slave trade, says A.E. Rooks, author of a compelling new book, The Black Joke, published on Thursday. So... None of this answers the question, who was Thomas Barley? Uh, I will read this excerpt, uh, but I'm not going to show you it. I will show you this logbook, which you should all look up. Uh, this is a logbook of the Black Joke during the events. And I will read you this posting from the London Gazette on April 17th, 1829. Commodore Collier has transmitted to the Right Honorable John Wilson Crooker a letter from Lieutenant Henry Downs, commanding the Black Joke, tender to His Majesty's ship Sybil, reporting that on the 1st of February last, the Black Joke captured on the coast of Africa after a long chase and a gallant action a Spanish slave vessel called the Almirante, with 466 slaves on board. The Black Joke carried two guns and 55 men. The Almirante, 14 guns and 80 men. And Commodore Collier expressed in high tenor his sense of the gallant and skillful conduct of Lieutenant Downs and of the zeal and courage of the officers and men under his orders. In this successful action against a vessel of very superior force, the Spanish vessel had 15 killed, including her captain and first and second mates, and 13 wounded. The following is a return of the loss on board the Black Joke. Mr. T.P. Lee Hardy, Admiralty Mate, wounded. Mr. Richard Roberts, mate of His Majesty's ship Medina, wounded. Thomas Barley, gunner's crew, wounded. John Byatt, able seaman, wounded. Jeremiah Johnson, able seaman, wounded, since dead. James Elliot, able seaman, wounded, since dead. Now, I really could have made this video about any of the names on this list. They all played a part in this battle, which resulted in a reputation, which resulted in a success, which resulted in treaties, and further success, which resulted in the end of the slave trade. Or at least heavily influenced it. Again, this is such a massive undertaking, it's impossible to point at any one man or even any one ship, but this is so significant, given the chain of events, I had to point it out. And part of me wanted to make this video about the men that died. Some reports say two, some say one. But I wanted to make it about Thomas Barley, because of the emphasis on the success of the gunnery, specifically resulting in the success. Now, a gunner's mate usually is not actually the person firing the guns, although that could have been different in this case because I believe usually it's a lieutenant, but it was a lieutenant that was captaining the ship. It was a very small ship with a very small crew. What gunner's mates usually do is they assist the gunner, who is in charge of the gunpowder, and getting gunpowder to the guns and maintaining the guns and training the crew in good gunnery. And he was an assistant to the gunner. And the gunnery is a major part of what won them the battle. It was a small part. This man did a small part in an operation that was helpful to the gunnery, which was a major part in the success in this battle, which they should not have won, and had very little chance of winning. But this victory led to, a, again, a reputation, which led to a change in tactics, which led to further 
other success, which led to treaties. And again, we, we, you saw the change in history. You don't know the names of any of the people on this list. Hopefully now you know one. And uh, if I were to have one one thousandth the impact that Thomas Barley had on history, I would die a happy man. So you may not think that what you are doing has a significant impact. And you will likely not see the impact of whatever it is you are doing. But history is full of Thomas Barley's. People who do things that ultimately help with great things that they will probably never see. But that doesn't mean that you shouldn't do small things that may result in great things. That's all I have to say about that. I hope you all have the ability to do small or great things with God's speed.